Good day, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Audon Royal and Royal Caribbean. I'm Ed Reef, your art director. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to each and every guest. Today we have a, a special treat. We have Mike Thompson, our port and shopping agent. Mike uh, is very good. He's very fluent in why we should buy things uh, on board and also at the ports of call. And I'd like to pose that same question to Mike. Mike, uh, why would we buy art on board a cruise ship as opposed to a brick and mortar gallery? Well, there's a couple of good reasons. You would maybe to start we would want to talk about why we would collect anything because mm -hmm. as a people as a as a species we're 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 gatherers we're collectors we're hoarders it's it's hardwired in us so a lot of people will have uh, collections of coins or stamps or baseball cards or uh, things like that and every, almost everybody's got a collection of something if you were to pull people on the ship almost everybody has a collection of something and they collect for a couple of different reasons. Number one is they're passionate about it. And people get their collections for different reasons. Maybe, uh, maybe they got it, and maybe they inherited the collection. Maybe uh, they bought a porcelain frog for their desk one time, and the next thing you know, every time there's a birthday or an anniversary or something like that, there's another porcelain frog, and lo and behold, there's a porcelain frog collection. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons, but the main reason people do collections is because they're passionate about the collections. That's the big reason why you collect anything. Uh, you collect things to become um, a little bit of an expert on what you're collecting, whether you're, if you're collecting stamps or coins or something, you're buying buyer's guides and things like that to extend your knowledge of your subject matter. And once you have that knowledge, it creates tremendous pride of ownership. And at the end, that, that collection of yours winds up, you, you, you pass it on to somebody that you think is going to take great care of it. And by doing that, you create a cultural legacy that gets passed on from generation to generation. And that's why you collect anything. Now, specifically well, art. Sir. Yeah. Uh, and why collect specifically art? Well, say you have a coin collection or a stamp collection or a baseball card collection. Normally those are going to be kept in albums, kept on a shelf, maybe in a safe or something like that. And the only time you ever get to appreciate it is when you take the albums out and, uh, and thumb through them. It's different with art. D art is designed to be on display all the time. It's designed to be beautifying your home. It's designed to be bringing happiness and joy into your life every time you walk by it in the hall. Uh, Art is something that there's something for every taste. As you walk through the beautiful gallery here on board, there's something that's going to reach across and it's going to grab you and say, look at me. And that's the art you want to be collecting. There's, uh, by the same token, there's something on, in the collection here, in the Art on Royal collection, for every budget. And when you find something that is appealing to you visually and appealing to your wallet, it just makes sense to collect it, right? Absolutely. Now, uh, without hyperbole, Royal Caribbean's commitment to art is so strong. There is $150 million worth of art on board throughout the fleet that it's called our Onboard Traveling Collection. I believe it's the largest traveling ongoing art show in the world. It's certainly that, one that, of them. In fact, in, certainly one of them. Yes, and in addition to the art that's all around the ships, especially the Serenade over here, we have our gallery, we have our live, informative, and entertaining art auctions. If anyone has ever been to an art auction, it's, it's a wonderful experience. We have free raffles, free prizes, free giveaways, free art for anyone that attends. We also have a lot of champagne. We have a two-drink minimum. <laughs> Tell us a little bit. That's the way I run my auctions. No pain except champagne. Now, uh, tell us something about the art auctions. What, what could uh, our guests expect? Well, uh, the art auctions themselves are fun. They're fast-paced. Uh, they tend to go very, very quickly. They're request-based auctions because exactly. every, everything at the auction, everything that comes up over the block at the auction is something that somebody in the, in the audience has requested come through the auction. That's one of the things that makes it exciting is everything is appealing to somebody in the room. And that's one of the things that lets it go quite a bit faster. Uh, that, that's a very good point. It's a request-only auction, right? Uh, now, we have artists on board, and people uh, come up to me all the time that are artists and say, hey, I want to put my art on board. It doesn't really happen that way. Um, we source our art directly with our art, our art managers, our, our artists themselves. Like, for instance, we have Lena Sutskova. We have a di direct one-on-one -on -one relationship with she and her husband, Sergei. Romero Brito is, uh, is direct uh, exclusively to Royal Caribbean, his images. Um, and we have the Salvador Dali collection. And behind me, original works of art by uh, Chris Derubis. Now, tell us a little bit about provenance. Well... But more important, I mean, there's, I, I say that there's five P's. The five P's, the, okay. The five P's that uh, the gallery directors, uh, museum curators, art historians, and art critics use to determine the desirability of a particular work of art. And you can take those and you can distill those down to five P's. The first P would be uh, 
the prestige of the artist. Prestige of the artist is probably more important than anything else. Is, is that more like commercial success or well, that's, critical it's, acclaim? It's or? part of it. Uh, uh, yeah. The prestige of an artist, uh, for instance, I could, uh, I could take and make a work of art, which in my case would look like a lot like a stick figure. Uh, <laughs> art is could, anything you can get away with. <laughs> exactly. Andy Warhol said, right? so, uh, it's, it's objective, <laughs> subjective, and emotional, then it's art. That's wonderful. But I could yeah. offer you my original, unique, one of a kind work of art, or I could offer you uh, an etching by Pablo Picasso. Which one would you rather own? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, the, okay not, it's, a, it's okay. You're not going <laughs> to offend me, right? Uh, because Picasso is much more prestigious artist than I am, believe it or not. But how uh, did he get there? <laughs> well, the prestige of an artist, there's four main things that, that determine the prestige of the artist. Is the artist being, uh, has he had showings in major galleries or is he in the permanent collection of major museums? A good example here would be Romero Brito. Uh, Romero Brito, this is fun, uh, kind of joyous art that looks like it might be just kind of fizzy, frothy kind of pop art. But uh, he's actually an innovator. That's one of the one of the major things when you're talking about the prestige of an artist is the artist an innovator is the artist doing something that's never been done before or taking an existing artistic technique and using it in a way that's never been done before so he's uh, walking through a door maybe exactly he's walking through one of those two doors uh, Romero Brito is the father of a movement called neo-pop cubism the best description I ever heard of that was from uh, from <laughs> neo-pop neo -pop <laughs> neo cubism neo -pop and he the best description I ever heard of that was from the art critic of from the Los Angeles Times he called it uh, Picasso channeling Matisse through the prism of Hello Kitty Wow yeah, it's a great wow. description because the imagery here is clearly pop imagery but uh, <laughs> there's but there's cubist elements to it there's the, the, the non-traditional use of color for, dr for dramatic effect that was the hallmark of the Fovis like, like Matisse. Uh, so you've got all that going on here, but then you have this artist who's... Oh, oh no worries. <laughs> everybody wants to get into the act. Uh, he's, he's one of our paid extras. <laughs> yes. Uh, Not to sign a waiver. <laughs> but then you talk about the prestige of the artist, even though the, this seems like kind of fizzy, poppy art. Yeah. Romero Brito has been exhibited twice at the Louvre, He's in the permanent collection of the uh, of the Vatican Museum. He's in right. Hyde Park as well, right? Well, and, and, and he's received the major commissions. Seas. That's that's another thing about Providence is the artist received major commissions, right? Uh, Romero Brito, to keep with the example, has the largest has, holds the record for the largest uh, exhibit ever in Hyde Park in London. He did a 40 foot tall pyramid in Speaker Square in Hyde Park. Uh, the largest freestanding aluminum sculpture in the world is at Dadeland Mall in Miami, and it's a burrito. Uh, and then finally, for prestige of the <laughs> artist, is the artist commercially successful? And it's one thing for art, for art critics and so forth to say, um, you know, well, this guy's art is staggering and wonderful, but then you ask, would this be something that you hang on your walls? And they say, oh, no, 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 it's far too vulgar for my taste. Uh, Romero Brito is, 10 years ago, Romero Brito was a $12 million a year business. He's Corporation very, Romero. He's a hugely right. successful artist. Major commissions from from Absolute Vodka, BMW, Volvo, uh, Disney. Well, what about Royal Caribbean? Apparently, Royal Caribbean. Yeah. Right. Can you tell us about the ships that have his art exclusively on board? Well, there are standalone Romero Brito galleries on uh, the Allure of the Seas and the Freedom of the Seas and the Mariner of the Seas. The entire pool deck is decorated. Uh, Romero Brito decorated the entire pool deck of the Mariner of the Seas. You know, it, it, it reminds me artist. of Don Chihuly and, and the Bellagio and his relationship with uh, Steve Wynn. Very much. Uh, so that's Romero Brito. Excellent. So that's, yeah. that's the prestige of the artist. Probably the most important factor. Second factor is one you alluded to earlier, provenance. The, uh, the history of ownership of a work of art. It's used to establish the, 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 va the validity, the authenticity of the work of art. But it's also used more broadly to talk about uh, the source that you're collecting your art from. And as you right. mentioned a little earlier, uh, Art on Royal has fantastic provenance on all their art because they have a direct relationship with either the artist or their publishers. And we'll talk about why that's a little bit, where, why it's very important in a couple so, of minutes. So we did the two P's. We did prestige. Does the artist and have critical, critical claim right. or, or uh, uh, commercial success? Mm -hmm. uh, provenance. Um, what about process? Pro <laughs> process is the next P. Process. All right, it is the next P. The, uh, the, the, method that the artist used to create the work of art. All things being equal, the closer that work of art is to the hand of the artist, the more desirable the work of art. And there's me, a couple of different an, levels. Yeah, I was going to give you an example. When I went to the Louvre a couple of years ago, I, I bought a poster of uh, 
Mona Lisa. Now, that's, did Leonardo da Vinci have anything to do with that? Of course not. All right, so that, that's the definition, I think, of when, a poster. And way. more importantly, uh, when the Louvre runs out of posters of Mona Lisa, they don't have to get with the Leonardo da Vinci estate. They just crank out some more. All right. Uh, it, so Now, it what comes to mind, and we do have Peter Max, but not on this ship, um, he mass-produced the 60s, but yet he is completely involved in the process of making his art. What's right. the difference between a Peter Max and a... And a uh, Poster at the Louvre. Well, for instance, uh, Peter Max, as you said, was okay, I, the question's no, too hard. No, was, was <laughs> intimately involved in in the, in the 60s when he first hit his popularity with his right. pop art. Uh, he he was actually on the lithographic press, making Mixing the posters, colors and, and doing the color blends and all these things. So every poster that came off the uh, the press was an original Peter Max. He was intimately involved in the creation of that work of art. And, it, and that was a lithograph, so it was a limited edition yeah, lithograph. It, well, they, they weren't even limited editions. It's interesting. He, he, he so did, they're, they're originals. He, he, did, he did an interview with Larry King years and years ago, <laughs> and he said in this interview that uh, when he first created these, the very first poster he made, he was they cost six cents to make. He'd wholesale them for a dollar, and they'd sell in stores for two dollars. And if he's, you still, he's still going strong with uh, yeah. with iPod applications for happy <laughs> birthday cards. We love Peter Max. Getting back to some of the uh, art that we have on board, uh, Lena Sutskova is a Russian artist. She's from St. Petersburg. She's uh, sourced directly, she and her husband, Sergei, in uh, Miami. And uh, we have something called their G-Clay's Hand Embellished Oil on Canvas. The G clay is a fancy word. It means to spray. Now, that that what process is the G clay as opposed to those ancient techniques, like the stenciling technique of serigraph or lithograph, which we just described. Well, and it's important yeah. to understand that the the process for making a graphic work isn't really that important. Uh, if you're if you're going to a Ford dealership and you're looking right. for a Mustang, uh, you don't go walking through every car in the lot saying, "What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that?" You go to the Mustangs and say, "Tell me about that." And Right, the, right. There, there really is no difference in value per se between a lithograph, a serigraph, a clay. Uh, well, uh, I'm interrupting, excuse me, but uh, hold that thought. Uh, Picasso, for instance, I mean, the technique at the time was lino, uh, uh, lino, cut, yeah. lino cut, which is linoleum. I mean, it's an, that's an ancient technique, and yet his, there's so much value in what he did. Why, why so? Well, because it gets back to the prestige of the artist. He was an innovator. He actually invented linocut. Uh -huh. It was very similar to woodcut, but he used linoleum as the matrix instead of wood, created an entirely new way of creating graphic art. And that was when he was in his 80s, right? No, he was, he was uh, well, it was well, a little bit earlier than that. A little bit that. earlier than that, yeah. But uh, one of the, I mean, you talk He's about... constantly reinventing himself, going through that the same door like 15 times, Yeah, right? as many as 15 it, times, according to some art critics. So that's why he's such an important artist in the history of art. Right. And then, so after the process right. would, would come the production run. Very important mm -hmm. because this, you want this, all things being equal with a work of art. With, and it, obviously production run only refers to, to graphic works because if yeah. it's a unique one-of-a-kind painting, the production run is one, right? So, so on the pinnacle of the, of the triangle at the top of the, run, at the, at the, top of the right, pyramid the top is, of the pyramid is, is original work of art. Right, they then, can only be owned by one person at a time. Right, like our uh, Chris Derubis over here. And now the second level, we've got a uh, serograph, lithograph. Well, uh, after that, you have something like uh, the embellished works, uh -huh. an embellished work that uh, would be a unique variation. Where <laughs> We've got a little, <laughs> come on, guys, come on come in. Come on through, guys. Come on through, that's good. Wait, so I uh, just like one take. That's good, right? So when you get to when you get to the production yeah. run, production run is important because with graphic works you want to have as few in the edition. The, the, the fewer in the edition, the more valuable each one is. And that's just right. plain supply and demand. And then finally, the last of the P's. So there's there's prestige, provenance, process, production run. The last one is proportion, and that's the relative size of the work of art. The, the uh, all things being equal, the larger the work of art, the more valuable. And now that's the least important of the five. Right. But if you're, for instance, somebody like, like Romero Brito, Hyde and Park you're doing, <laughs> and you're doing Hyde Park, an exhibit, in, uh, yeah, if you're doing a, a, an exhibit in his gallery in South Beach or something like that, he's going to lead as you walk in the door. He's going to lead with his big works of art because they're they're more visually captivating. And then he'll have his smaller works of art mm -hmm. in and around those. And the same thing is true in your home. Uh, art should be the focal point of any room you put it in. And mm -hmm. any room you put art in, it should be what draws your attention, what immediately pulls focus in the room. Uh, and if it's not doing that, if the art in your home right now is there because it matches the sofa, do yourself a favor and wallpaper because it's cheaper. <laughs> uh, the art should be the visually arresting thing in, your, in every room you put it in. Uh, and 
I like to One break it down even simpler, uh, more simple, is that it is going to make you smile or make you think. I mean, and if you bu buy it because you like it, buy it because you like it. Exactly. When right. see it, you now, like now it, Salvador Dali, we, we, we don't want to leave him out. He's a very important artist, part of the surrealistic movement. Um, do you have a few uh, words to say about the gentleman who said, I don't do drugs, I am drugs? <laughs> <laughs> what did he really very, say? Very yeah. true. And you've got right. two great examples here. The top one here is from his uh, Divine Comedy Divine Woodcut Comedy. series. This is uh, what we have here is that same image put on a tile mm -hmm. uh, and then on the bottom is uh, is a piece from his equestrian series from 1971 again put on tile it's a it's a reproduction on tile uh, because the the original woodcuts are getting very hard to come by they're very very scarce mm -hmm. uh, if you can even find one and right. th this is a great way to have Dali in your home and I I love Salvador Dali because uh, Again, you go back to the prestige of the artist. He wasn't an innovator in the Surrealist movement. Uh, he didn't invent Surrealism. Surrealism actually started out as a literary movement, and its founder was André Breton. However, the Salvador, Dali, the floor, right? well, Salvador Dali reinvented what Surrealism was. So he took that thing that already existed and turned it into something that didn't exist. He was very proud of his skills as a draftsman. He didn't want to give those up to create yep. the kind of Surrealist art that was there in the time. So he would, he would create these very carefully constructed compositions using fantastic imagery that was all from his subconscious during his dream state. And in a way, I think you just said the definition of genius, which is not only constant attention, but actually putting two normal things together and getting an abnormal <laughs> result or exactly. something. Right? Exactly. So that's it. Just to sum up now, thank you, Mike, for your expertise. And uh, we, we, we love uh, what you do. And thank you for the value we had. The quality of our art is the quality of our artists. We simply have some of the best in the world, living contemporary, and uh, we, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. So look around the gallery, ask either me or my assistant, or Mike if he's still on the ship. I know he's gonna be, uh, going to be... You're going on vacation yeah. and going up to Alaska, and, and uh, I wish you well over there. And, Thank you. Uh, it's the land, you'll be working until <laughs> midnight, I think. <laughs> yes. Uh, right? Because yes. It's the land of the midnight sun. It's uh, white nights. It's but, uh, coffee. <laughs> there's plenty of coffee. And, and, and value. Uh, simply, uh, w without understating this, uh, in a brick and mortar gallery, they're always in high rent districts. You could expect to pay the overhead, you and I, in a retail environment. This is uh, incredible pricing on all our work of art. And oh, I forgot to mention, you mentioned something about cars. You don't buy cars without tires. You don't, we don't sell pictures without frames, and the frames come free as well. And, and something like this, museum quality plexiglass, what you see is what you get. It's full value. It's a really and good point. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, really, because you, if anybody's ever got anything framed, they know. Uh, well, and you're not going to buy a beautiful piece of fine art and put it on your wall with thumbtacks. Yeah, right. Oh, and it comes with all the, the fasteners and the hangings and all that. And uh, actually, convenience. I mean, it, you would have to go to probably 13 galleries in, in, in 13 cities and two or three continents to, with, to actually visually see all the art that we bring out at our live, informative, and entertaining art auctions, and also uh, at the gallery and throughout the ship. So, Mike, uh, I wish you well. Thank you very much Thank for you. the value add, and we'll take care. We'll see you on board.